So Nicole from USA Today. Nicole Auerbach, USA Today. Billy, we, we talked so much and we heard you talk about Shabazz so much. How, how important is Ryan Boatwright to, to what they do and how have you seen him as you've watched film since when you guys played him? Have you seen him grow? Well, you know, Shabazz is a great player and he gets a lot of attention and rightfully so. But I think I said yesterday that it's not just a, a one-man team. Um, you know, Boatwright is a uh, terrific offensive player, um, plays with great energy on the defensive end of the floor. Daniels, Brima, Gafai, you know, they're, they're a whole team. Now, certainly, Shabazz has got the ball in his hands. He takes a lot of big shots, makes a lot of big shots, creates a lot for himself and for others. But Boatwright's one of those guys that can do it on his own, too. You know, he, he's got great ball skills. He's fast. Uh, he's a good athlete. Uh, he can beat you off the bounce. He can shoot it from behind the line. He's good in pick and roll. Uh, you know, so you, it's, it's, it's not a team where you look at them, you say, well, if you can do a good job on one guy, you're going to be in good shape. They, they really are a good team. And I think everybody here left playing has multiple ways to win games. And certainly Connecticut's no different. All the way to the left side. That from the Florida Times Union. Billy, uh, along that, those same lines, how much comfort does it give you as a coach to be coaching a team that's arguably one of the more balanced teams in the country where maybe you don't have to rely as heavily on one person the way UConn does on Napier. As a coach, how much comfort does that give you? Well, the one thing I would say about with Shabazz, which is a little bit different, is, is he is a very, very good distributor of the ball. Uh, he gets fouled a lot. He gets to the free throw line a lot. He opens up things for other guys. I would say Scotty Wilbekin, maybe in a different way, does some of those similar things for our team, you know, as well. But I think if you look at Connecticut's team, on any given night, Daniels could go for 20, 25. Boatwright could get 20 or 25. Uh, Gafai, if he's left open, could get 20 or 25. They have enough players that can really score. And I've always believed, at least for our system and our style with the way we try to play, we try to be balanced. You know, I'd like to have anywhere from four to six guys in double figures because you don't know what a team's going to try to take away from you. And when a team takes certain things away from you, you still got to be able to have other guys step up in different situations and provide offense. And for the most part, our system is predicated on reading defense more so than just say, hey, listen, we're just going to go at this guy and try to get him 30 shots tonight and hopefully they go in. I think we try to read defense and see what's open and available. To the right side in the center. Hey, Billy, right here in the center, Ryan Bass, Bright House Sports Network. Uh, talking to Coach Ali, he said that he has so much respect for you, called you, you know, a future Hall of Famer. What kind of respect level do you have for him only in his second year bringing his team to the Final Four? You know, obviously being a Big East guy and being a little bit older than Kevin, but following the Big East and his career, knowing some people uh, in the NBA that the way they've talked about his leadership quality, uh, I think it's always a challenge and difficult when you take over for a great coach like Jim Calhoun, but I think Kevin has done it in such a class way. Um, when you play as long as he's played and you've had the success he's had as a player, he understands for himself what wins and how he wants his team to play and how he uh, wants his team to reflect himself. Uh, I've been really, really impressed. You know, his coaching and all those things speak for themselves. I mean, you can watch his team play. They play hard. They're unselfish. Um, they, they, they play together. They have energy, enthusiasm. Uh, he's done a great job. What, what impresses me even more with Kevin is, is the kind of person he is. You know, just the way he has incorporated Coach Calhoun. Uh, the respect he gives Coach Calhoun as a, as a you know, a, uh, his former coach. Um, y you know, I, I think he's handled that whole situation very, very well. And at the same point, he's been able to put his stamp, you know, his fingerprint on Connecticut's basketball program the last two years. And he's an outstanding coach and a great guy, and I've got equally as much respect for him and all the way around, the way he runs his program and the kind of guy he is, and obviously what he's done coaching. The next question is to the back left. Coach, uh, Reed Forgrave, Fox Sports 1. Uh, you've coached a lot of extraordinarily talented teams, but never won with the type of expectations that John Calipari had coming into this season. And I'm curious, as a coach, how you put into perspective Kentucky's up and down season and how they've handled those sort of expectations? Well, we had it in 2007 
you know, our whole starting five came back off a national championship. And we started preseason number one, and we had to deal with that. Um, I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, and I've, I've used this as an example before, I've got a, an enormous amount of respect for Andrew Wiggins as a player. I've seen Andrew Wiggins play a lot. Uh, Andrew Wiggins is no different than any young player. It's going to take him some time to reach his fullest potential. But it's interesting in the preseason how everybody's talking about who's going to dump games in the NBA to get Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins is a terrific player, but he's not just changing a franchise once he gets there. And I think what happens sometimes with young players coming in, people fail to realize that at times there is a growth period they have to go through. And there are some learning curves and there's some ups and downs that they all have to go through. Um, sometimes when you have some veteran guys around some younger guys, maybe the, the fall isn't as hard. For example, Chris Walker, Casey Hill, two freshmen, really talented players, have been able to kind of have the help of some older guys. Um, so there is a growth period that I don't think anybody necessarily escapes. Now, there are guys, you know, like a Brad Beal, like an Anthony Davis, uh, that have come through the SEC that are just so good, they've got it kind of figured out, and they can impact the game right away. Uh, but for most guys, it's a process they have to go through. On the left side. Nancy Armour, USA Today Sports. Bill, you talked yesterday about thinking that something needs to be done to, for the players um, in terms of increasing the benefits or making it more fair. What do you think about you know, the amount of money that you make compared to what the kids do and don't get? And as a coach and, and former player in this tournament, are you ever concerned that some of the issues today could affect this or you know, make it go away or, or change what has become the NC tournament as we know it now? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not saying that the system is always fair or right, and I think in any system you can look at it and say, is it fair and right? Um, I think that's why change is good. I think that's why people look at what's right, what's wrong, what we can do. Um, I, this is what I think has happened from an evolution from when I played. When I played in this event 26 years ago, there was, there was a meaning about playing for Providence College. There was a meaning and a value about, back then it was glorified that you just got a scholarship to college, that your family didn't have to pay for your education, um, and you needed your degree to move on, and, and, and representing um, your school and your school colors and putting a college uniform on and representing the Big East, there were a lot of those things 26 years ago that were really valuable. I think what's happened now is because of the opportunity to earn money in the game of basketball, those opportunities are far greater than they were 26 years ago. And a lot of kids now look at this as I've got a earning window to make money playing this game. And really in a lot of ways I have a lifetime to get my degree. And I can never earn as much money with my degree coming out of college that I could if I took an overseas job, forget the NBA. I mean, we've had guys that have been in Florida that have, you know, have been well over six figures as it relates to, um, you know, contracts. And that's not even in the NBA. Um, so there's an opportunity. They say, listen, my body, my talent, all those kind of things. So I think when you talk about all those things there, um, we have set up a system in our country that we've brought academics and athletics together as an avenue for a player to get to where he wants to get to. And I understand the D-League has been formed, and people say, well, you can go to the D-League, but really, in essence, the way the system is set up, it's set up that guys have got to go to school, they got to represent, that's, that's the best way, and right now, probably the most logical way for these guys to pursue a professional career. And I think you'll start to see probably down the road some things change. I don't know what the solutions are. I don't know what the answers are. But I think there's certainly a lot more can be done for the student athletes. On the right side of the aisle. Yeah, hi. Uh, Barry Horn, Dallas Morning News. Uh, in the age of one and done, you have a team with, uh, you have four four and dones in, in your lineup. Does, is that by design or by coincidence? And uh, would you take a one, somebody who was projected to be one and done? You know, I get asked this a lot. Um, I cannot, as a coach, forecast a player's future. For instance, after Joe Kim Noah's freshman year, I would have said there is no way in the world 
that this guy is going to be a first-round draft pick after his sophomore year, and he would have been the number one player taken in the draft. I would have said the same thing after Maurice Spates' freshman year, that there's no way this guy is going to be able to leave after his sophomore year. First-round draft pick. As a coach, you never know. Now, there's certain guys you do know when you recruit him. I knew Brad Beal was probably going to be a guy a couple years ago that was going to be here shortly. Patrick Young had an opportunity for three straight years to leave. He probably would have gone in the first round after his freshman year. He decided to come back. So some players you just don't know. It's not necessarily by recruiting design where I look at a high school kid and say, okay, great, let's recruit this guy because he's going to be here for four years. Um, I thought Nick Calathis would be a guy that would stay on our campus for three or four years, and he took an overseas job after his sophomore year. You don't know as a coach. You know, these guys make decisions um, and a lot of times you don't know how fast they develop or you don't know what kind of opportunities are put in front of them to make those kind of choices. On the left side of the aisle. Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman had a two-part question, Billy. One, uh, Rob Lanier described you as a serial question asker, and uh, especially as it pertained to scouting reports on opponents. I wonder if you could explain that first. Yeah. I, um, I think the best way for me um, is to learn, is to, is to try to be a good question asker. I think there's a lot of value in being able to do that. Um, I think being able to open up opportunities inside your staff for guys to talk freely. I think a lot of times when you have an assistant coach talking to a head coach, sometimes they're a lot more guarded you know, in terms of what they believe or really feel or think. And I think as a coach, it's my responsibility to put them in a, in a, in a situation where they have the opportunity to express themselves. And for me, asking a lot of questions, um, you know, in scouting is, is a way. You know, why do you want to guard it this way? Why do you want to do it? Why? You know, uh, how, what about this? What about that? And what ends up happening is when you ask questions like that, you find out how convicted a person is to what he really believes. And that's probably what I'm looking for more than anything else is how convicted are you in what you believe. So uh, I think it's a great way to learn. I think it's a great way for somebody to feel comfortable to express themselves, their ideas and their thoughts. And um, maybe it's a idiosyncrasy of mine, but I, I do ask a lot of questions. Did you have a follow? The follow up, Billy, yeah. after your short dalliance with Orlando, you're still somewhat intrigued by the NBA or do you feel like I've got a comfort zone at Florida and I like to break John Wooden records? Yeah, I never, I never look at it like that. I mean, I'm very, very happy at Florida. The question I get asked all the time is, you know, the intrigue of the NBA for me is it's basketball 24 hours a day. I'm a basketball junkie. I was a gym rat as a player. I love the game. Um, you know, we talk about this all the time. Whenever the season ends, you're, you're kind of lost for a little while. There's no film to watch. There's really no practices to prepare for. And, and as a coach, I think all of us in college, we love that. That's the thing that intrigues, I think, any coach is that the NBA, it's just straight basketball. You're just dealing with straight basketball, and that's, you know, what I love. So that was the part that's exciting or intriguing when you look at that part of it. On the left. Clarence Hill with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Can you talk about Frazier's work ethic? He puts up like 400 shots, you know, before the game, although he hasn't really been lights out in the tournament. How important is this three-point shooting to what you do and your success in spreading the floor? Michael's as hard of a working kid that I've ever been around. I mean, he really, really works at shooting the basketball. I never have to worry about dragging him into the gym or getting him extra shots. I mean, he really, really, really works at it. Um, He's got a great ability to shoot the ball. Uh, our team, myself, we feel very confident when he shoots the ball. But like anything else, it's you know, like a guy hitting a baseball. There's going to be some nights he shoots it at an unbelievably high level, and there's going to be some nights where maybe he doesn't shoot it as well. Uh, but we have confidence in Michael when he does shoot the basketball. And I think for anybody, when, when, when shots go in, it's not just our team. I think it helps any team. All the way in the front. Billy, John Zuberin of the Palm Beach Post. Can you talk about um, what Scotty has been doing this week in practice to prepare to match up against Shabazz and what problems Shabazz might present for Scotty on the offensive end? Well, I've always said this, and I do believe this. I believe great offense always beats great defense. Um, and, and Shabazz is a, a great offensive player, and Scotty is a great defensive player. Um, 
but Scotty is not going to be able to deal with Shabazz one on one. You know, we've we, we've been a team that's played collectively as a group on the defensive end of the floor, and Scotty's going to need help because Kevin puts Shabazz in a lot of situations that he's coming off screens, he's in pick and rolls with the floor spread, and you know to put Scotty on an island and expect him all by himself to handle him. Um, Shabazz is just too gifted offensively, so it's got to be a group effort for everybody. Not only him, it's got to be a group effort against DeAndre Daniels and against Boatwright, against Gafai, you know, just their entire team. It's got it's to be a group effort. It can't be Scotty versus Shabazz and Michael Frazier versus Boatwright and will you get ver That's not who we've been and that's not how we've played this year. On the right side of the aisle. Billy Tom Corrin from ABC in Tampa. Could you talk about the, the, the correlations between the two programs and, and the fact that uh, UConn has been to the uh, uh, Final Four three to the last five, you've won a couple, you know, you banging on the Elite Eight. Talk about that and, and the significance of these two programs going up in this semifinal. Well, I know for us, to, to, to make deep runs in the, um, in the NCAA tournament is really, really hard. Um, and I know a lot of people looked at the last three years and said, you know, Geez, I haven't been able to get to the Final Four. And I imagine if we've been to the Final Four the last three years, they're saying, geez, they just couldn't get to the national championship game. It never ends. But if you really take a step back and realize how hard that is for what our team has done, going to four straight Elite Eights, I don't know how many schools in the country have done that. Certainly we're disappointed when it ends. We're no different than anybody else. We'd like to continue on and play all the way through to Monday. But what our guys have done in terms of establishing a level of consistency, because you could be better from one year to the next and be ousted out of the tournament being a better team. It's a one-shot game. Anything can happen, and that's why I think people are so uh, captivated by watching the tournament. So I think UConn's kind of done the same thing in a lot of ways. You know, when Jim Calhoun was there, I was playing at Providence and actually played against his team when he was head coach at Northeastern. And he took that program and built it up, and he got to several Elite Eights, and they had a hard time, and then they had a breakthrough, and they got to the Final Four, and they've won several national championships, and Kevin has just picked up and continued on that tradition. In the back to the left. Yeah, Billy, Ron Higgins, NOLA.com, Thomas Picune. Going back to your seniors, is there a certain pride that this team, I mean, the old-fashioned way, stuck together, you know, nobody left, they, they all realized they had work to do every year. Is there a certain pride about watching a, t a team grow like this? You know, Ron, I, I, I'm... I'm um, happier or prouder. They've learned some valuable lessons on the court, no question, being here for four years at Florida. But the thing I'm much, much more pleased with is they've got a lot of experiences that were very difficult, very challenging, that I think is going to take them to the next step in their life, that they're going to be able to handle life's adversity a lot better because it wasn't always easy for them. And I give them credit for being persistent, for staying the course, uh, for dealing with their personal struggles and challenges, to try to overcome them, to battle them, to deal with them, to deal with them head on. Um, I think a lot of times as players, when you're heavily recruited and things are not going well, it's easy to deflect. It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. This has never happened to me. And the fact that they looked themselves in the mirror and said, here's an area I need to change. Here's where I need to get better. Uh, I think if they can keep that approach once they leave here, I think they're going to be so much better off. So, yes, it's very rewarding to see those guys stick with it and obviously have success that's translated onto the court as well. On the right side. Kozlov, Noah Kozlov, Cinesport. Coach, sometimes recruits just don't work out. So how do you know when you found your guy, when he's in your program, that you know this is a guy that, that can be here and, and can buy in? Within the first three weeks. Um... I can tell, now he may not be talent-wise where we want him and he needs to get better, but attitude-wise, I know within the first three weeks whether or not this is going to work or not, first month. Because practice starts and everybody's excited, okay? Then when the excitement of practice wears off, they're dealing with fatigue, they're having to push through. It's the first time they've played against high-level competition on a regular basis. Their work ethic gets exposed who they are gets exposed, their attitude gets exposed. And then when you start handing out minutes and maybe they're not playing as much as they want to or hope for, you start to see some things there. Uh, and I'm not saying that guys don't change, but you can tell attitude-wise, okay, this is gonna be a problem. This is gonna need to be addressed. Then there's some other guys you know, like, wow, 
this, this kid really has got a chance to be really, now he may not be where he's at talent-wise. He may, may help him get better with his skill set and those things. But a lot of times you can tell right away how a player handles adversity, how they handle coaching, how they handle practice, fatigue, being worn down, competition. I tell our guys this all the time. There's three things that don't get freshmen on the floor. One, they don't compete hard enough. They don't, they don't understand how hard they have to play. Two, they're not physically competitive enough to put their bodies in plays. And three is they have no idea what we're doing. They're just lost. It's, it's happening too fast. If you're missing any one of those three things for us, it's really hard to get on the floor and, and play a lot of minutes. Now, that's not to say that those things could not get better. But those things getting better are totally predicated on what is the player's disposition and attitude towards addressing those things. And I think for our older guys, as Ron talked about, those guys had to address those things and they got better at them. We'd like to welcome to the interview room at this time student athletes from Florida, Scotty Wilbekin, Casey Prather, Patrick Young, Will